Hey guys, I'm here with Philippe Andreoli, the uh, Angra bass player, and we are here at the Hard Rock Cafe Lyon in France. We are here at the lodge, the backstage, and uh, we've been touring here in Europe and talking a lot about music, many things about music, but uh, I want to talk about practicing because Philippe is an amazing uh, bass player, very technical, but very musical. Uh, we, talk, we talk uh, so many, uh, about so many things in music and I, I think it's going to be a cool uh, interview to share with you guys Philippe insights about how to practice, how to learn music, how to evolve as a musician. So we've been playing uh, together since 2001, so 2001. 18 years, <laughs> it's yeah. a long time yes. and I met Philippe, you were uh, very I'm young. Very young uh, at the music school you, you taught at and I was also having lessons at the time there. Yeah. So that was probably 98. Yeah, yeah, 98. Like he was like this prodigy, you know, very young. Yeah. Mm, yeah. On my way to playing all sorts of Jaco or fusion or all sorts of bass players. Yeah, at that time was metal thing. Uh, yeah. At that time I was getting into the fusion stuff like really. Old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to ask Felipe about your practicing routine and the process of learning complicated and difficult and hard songs. If you can yeah. tell us the way um, you do it, my process was always very intuitive. Uh, and it started out with just me experimenting with the instrument. I started out playing acoustic guitar and going through all those, you know, magazines with the with the chords for the songs, you know. Very intuitive and I had a teacher for, for a very short period of time back then, but uh, the bass became my toy. So I spent a lot of time with it. The bass and the acoustic guitar. In Brazil we play a lot of nylon acoustic guitar, the classical guitar. And it started out for me basically sitting by the radio, listening to music and learning Any. every Any. song, every Any. song. Everything, any you style. Know, one after the other, my mother would be crazy, you know, like doing something else. And I would be there with the guitar, learning every song. So the first step for me that was a big help uh, afterwards was training my ears. And I think you can do that even before getting into theory and scales and whatnot. Because uh, it's it comes before that. It's learning how to listen mm -hmm. and training your ear to recognize these sounds and these different tones yeah. and and chords. And of course, there will come a time when you will need assistance from a teacher or some kind of material. Where the harmony gets more complicated yeah. or something. To let you know what you're listening to. Mm -hmm. So now you have the ear for it, but you also know what it is. Yeah, yeah. So at a point in time, it, it was necessary for me to search for a good teacher, which was our friend Shimba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to teach me the, you know. The See, more like jazz yeah, harmonies. Uh, yeah. More like, more like fusion. Even before that. Mm -hmm. The scales and the arpeggios, yeah, yeah, but I have to say something about Felipe that it, that he he remembers everything. It's crazy. Yeah, good memory for songs. And, and but it might be because you were just playing any song from the radio. Maybe he started there, I yeah. guess. Because any song, like even my songs, if I, I sometimes I don't remember, I, I ask him. He's the you know uh, living songbook of any. Any Angra or My Soul career songs, he knows and any, maybe any Dream Theater or anything, well, pretty much, uh, he can just go and them. play, most of and uh, so what a memory, but probably because you also feel the note in a way and then you relate to the feeling and then you just go for it, maybe? Yeah, I think it's a, a kind of training where you connect the different sides of your brain uh, together to create that sound, you mm -hmm. know, so the more mathematical, side of the brain for, you know, the theory and what you're doing and whatnot, and the right side of the brain for the sensations that the note, the note cause you and the memory you have of the, those yeah, notes. Yeah. And then when this thing that you're doing, playing the bass with the radio, you kept doing throughout your whole life, Yes. Right? But then with albums and now probably with Spotify, right? Yeah. That's what you kind of do, still doing? Just the other day I was at home 
and I really love uh, the first uh, Rage Against the Machine album. Huh. So I just pressed play and played all the songs, no. you know, <laughs> one after yeah, the other. Yeah. But let me ask you something about when it goes to more something more. This is more like the the musical side, yeah. right? Like the feeling, the big the, re, the big picture. But like when it comes down to okay, I need to play that fast lick, or I need to double some fast phrase with the guitar because you're pretty good at it. Angra and my solo uh, career songs. There's a lot of bass and guitar doing a lot of fast yeah. uh, runs. And so, how do you practice to get to the this technical level? Because well, you're not playing with the radio songs no, that you could not get. No, this, right? uh, first of all, you need the theory to, to you know to be your your base to understand what's going on. Because if you don't, then you have to guess every note, and it becomes very hard. Mm -hmm. But if you know what's going on, you kind of have you know some some guidelines. Of course, if you talk about fusion, you can go anywhere. Mm -hmm. But mostly, you have kind of a line that you can kind of follow to find the notes. And then once you do find the notes, it's very important to bring it back in speed, break it up in many sections sometimes. So for example, a complicated phrase, you can break it up in many difficult sections, study each section separately, understand what challenges it becomes uh, with your right hand, with your left hand, and of course the synchronicity of the both hands, you know. Uh, and then work each part, and then slowly connect them until yeah. you get the big picture. So basically, yeah, yeah, the, the good the good practicing uh, um, routine. So so you get a, a, a big phrase that is difficult. So then you break it up in yeah. so a few parts, yeah. right? And then you get the first part. Play very slowly. Exactly. Kind of maybe turn it into an exercise. Could yes. be would be like okay so that you can even expand to the whole fingerboard. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Just about to say you can create an exercise and then create maybe like a song out of that or like an improvisation using only that, let's say like a problem or difficulty, right? Yes. And then you go to the next part. That's kind of what you do. Yeah, because no matter how many exercises you make, of course, the more exercises you have under your fingers the more prepared you're going to be for whatever comes. Mm -hmm. But there's always going to be something that someone creates that is a different way of thinking mm -hmm. that you're going to have to adapt to that. Mm -hmm. And there's no real preparation for some stuff. So you really have to get into it and learn it and te teach your fingers to do that. Especially with tapping, I find it very difficult to organize, you know, in your mind what Finger goes oh, where exactly. it's, it's not very chords, linear right? like for chords like and chords. arpeggios. It's not always linear, and there's the rhythm involved as well. Mm -hmm. So it takes some time, and then you slowly build up and create the whole part. So if you try to get like some basic rules of uh, practicing, would be just enjoying the the playing, yeah, right? First with the radio all, or the albums that you like. Yeah. Just try to learn, learn, get the sounds, and just try to. You like feel the music? Yeah, could be. it's like a toy. You know, you discover by yourself things. Yeah. Just get comfortable with the music. Yeah, like like really like a like a like a child. Like a child would do, like imagination, and then find the places, and so you're gonna have to do that for a certain level, and then the next step would be yeah. really I go to the books, the when teachers. When you feel the need for it, when you, you feel know? the need, yeah, okay. then go for it. Yeah. And then for the challenging phrases or songs, then break it up, play slowly, create exercises from each part of the difficult phrase, and then work there, and then you go and try to play the song, yeah. right? Don't try to play the difficult part of the difficult song before you do this preparation. Yeah. Break it up, break it there down. There are right? exceptions, uh, for example, some stuff that I do now, I started out trying to do it as fast as I could. And at, at, at first, it sounded awful. But then, if you keep trying, it becomes cleaner and cleaner and cleaner until somehow you teach yourself how to do that. And I saw a, an old interview with Shawlin, and he said the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's a process that by accident I ended up doing yeah. for some stuff, but it's not. For most. the past, yeah. yeah. There's a yeah. Th this is an, this is another technique of learning to yeah. play fast. It's like when you push 
push your, uh, push the limits, yeah. like try to get out of your plateau. You know, it's like going to the gym. Sometimes you have to put like to an extra, to yeah. an extra weight. Somebody has to be around there to you know, so you don't hurt yourself. But you have to push uh, yourself to uh, to the limits uh, or over the limits. Because, but I think that's my point of view now. You have to combine those two things, which is playing very slowly, which is like getting the shape to organize to organize the idea and really checking the movements in my case like the guitar pick you know the ups and downs and here synchronicity and then another moment you just try to play as fast as you can and don't criticize yourself there because you know it's over the limit and then you know it's going to be dirty you know you're going to, you're going to fail yeah. it's going to be hard but you're just putting your mindset into i'm able to play that speed or i'm you know try yeah. to to yeah, to create a mindset that you're ready to play something uh, faster than you could even imagine, and then you go back to the other practicing moment and try to correct the movements and combining the, those uh, two things. Yeah, that is the way to play faster and cleaner. Because sometimes it has two advantages. One is you're not limited by a number on the metronome, for example. You don't mm -hmm. know how fast you're playing. Mm -hmm. You're just playing as fast as you think you can at the moment. Yeah. You know, so there's no number to tell you it's going to be hard to get above it. Yeah. And the second thing is for some really fast stuff, the mechanic is not really the same as playing slow. Mm. It can be a little different, you know, just a tiny bit different. That's why uh, I'm thinking about doing a very slow motion version of me playing fast because it's not the same if you show it slow. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. when you play uh -huh. it fast, uh -huh. so there's a difference, and maybe that's beneficial. But don't, don't you think the closer it is, the better? It the better it is, of it course. Is. The more organized, and the result is yeah. going to be more yeah. consistent. Yes. Yeah, and more relaxed. More relaxed, you're going to be playing the fast sure. uh, yeah. phrases, right? Yeah. So for you, the metronome is a good thing, but can be a a bad thing too, because yeah. you always have this mindset: I will never play that fast. Or yeah, you're, you're always living by the number. And not really by you know the natural speed that you could play that that phrase or that line. And pushing your limits can be easier for some people if you don't have a measure. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's important to have a measure to you know track your progress. Mm -hmm. If you're that person that organized, for me not so much. You know I just like to go out there and try it, even just if it's playing. messy, and then make it become more uh -huh. clean and comfortable. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. But you can do that with the number, if you're like, as you said, like more organized, you like to have the number. Some people are more numbered, yeah. <laughs> number-like people. But at the same time, but if I ask you the speed of some some songs, some anger songs, you probably yeah. know. That's my reference. Because the song yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. But you know, like a speed, a fast song would be like 170. So you know, like, okay, I'm able to do this kind 16, of phrases. Yeah. This kind of phrases for that kind of song or for 170. If it's 120, I can do another. Yeah. Maybe 16 notes or no, maybe uh, triplets. Triplets, yeah. Very fast. Yeah. So I think it helps, uh, like, ideas of uh, BPMs or BPMs that works for uh, big arenas, you know. And the faster you get, it's harder to play in a big stage, just yeah. to just to hear things, you know. And it so, interferes with the arrangement that you do. Yeah, exactly. So I think the the BPMs, even when you compose, very very important. I, that's my opinion. Okay, because after a while, you know, okay, like a ballad in 105 is different than a ballad in 110 or 95. So. You kind of by the by the by the mode you're using, by the scale you're using, yeah. by the harmony and by the tempo, you kind of get design the feeling you wanna propose yeah. to the listeners, and that becomes yeah. natural to you as a composer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you kind of already go for the. the yeah. In the, the end, of, yeah. In the end, the metronome is a tool to help you to have a number. Right, of course, but if you can feel the, uh, yeah. the 95 or 130, even better. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, it's cool. So for you, you never, the metronome was always your, the, the albums. Yeah. Yeah. Or a drummer. Always with good drummers. Yeah. Yeah, or even the drummer at rehearsal. Uh, yeah. My music practice has always been musical. 
I always playing. Wow, well, that's yeah. another thing that Felipe. He's always playing with a lot of people. Yeah, you know, not like always jamming or uh, doing tribute bands. Yeah, just something whatever. to create, to some challenges or mm -hmm. to keep yourself uh, always playing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, know, keep yeah. it keeping fit. Yeah, without having to practice exercises at yeah, home. Yeah. I much prefer to be, play with people. You know, because yeah. music is not only music, but it's also communion. You know? Music is not only music, but it's also communion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and on that very note, <laughs> no, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Philippe is the guy. He's always playing with a lot of people, which is great because then you expand your musical yeah. skills in many directions. Yes, learning from everybody because that's one important thing that we see less and less, I guess. But you know. To sit down with, with another guy and just yeah or girl of course yeah guy or this girl. is something and very I, important that I always tell play. my students and anyone to score up there and play doesn't just matter play. what it is no even like yeah in, you know with a friend right yeah. just go there and jam for a few hours it's gonna be easier to play for a few hours if you have a friend playing with yeah. you or if you have a band even better even better than you know sitting there and. You stay hours at home. Some people can do it. I, I was able to do that, to sit and play with the albums and practice, have my routine of exercises. But for some people, it's easier just to jam That's and uh, rehearse. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So I hope this all this information uh, is helpful for you. I'm gonna put Philippe's channel here on the description and uh, leave your comments, and we might do more interviews in the future. Yeah. Right. Whatever you want. Yeah. Bom, bom, legal. Bom papo.